Hi, welcome to Chem with Chem. This is the full work through of the January 2018 edition of the CXC CSEC Chemistry Paper 2. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. There are more work throughs that are coming and you don't want to miss them. You can skip to your desired question using the timestamps on screen. Enjoy. Let's dive in. Daniel is provided with two solutions. Solution M is aqueous hydrochloric acid containing solution M. So M is an acid. So this is my paper in the exam. So I'm going to start writing on it. M is an acid whose concentration is 3.6 grams per dm cube. All right, that should start clicking. All right, then solution N is an aqueous sodium hydroxide in one dm cube of solution. So they give us the, they give us the volume. They tell us that they, they have a base here and it's in one dm cube, which is the same as, we have to remember that one dm cube is the same as a thousand centimeters cube, all right? So Daniel is asked to titrate solution M. So she's going to titrate the acid against 25 cm cube of solution N in order to, to determine the concentration of sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide here is our, is our, what you call it, our analyte. We're trying to figure out its concentration. All right, so we don't know the concentration of our sodium hydroxide. We have our acid and we know its concentration. So the acid is our, is our standard, standard solution or acid. So we're going to, so for the sodium hydroxide, we don't know its concentration, right? So its concentration, we don't know. So we're going to um, try to find out its concentration by titrating it with, uh, with the, the acid whose concentration is 3.6 grams per dm cube. They've given us the, con the concentration there. In, uh, well, they give us, they gave, they've given us the mass concentration. All right, so let's um, take it from there. So those are the things that we're, we're making note of so far. We have an acid, we have, a, we have a, a base. So M is our acid and N is our, N is our base, right? Now let's, let's, um, let's look at what we're um, asked to do. Figure one shows the buret volume readings then you'll obtain before, that's initial and after each of three titrations. So, the, you know, the key thing that we have to do when we get, um, the, we get our um, burette, we have to figure out what each of those stroke um, represents. And we have to look carefully. We're reading going, we're reading going down, we fill it up to zero, or even if it's not filled to zero, we know that after we've released a certain volume, um, we, we now look to see what volume would have been released. Um, by taking away from the final, the initial readings. So we have to take um, the initial readings first. All right, so we have to figure out each of these stroke right here represents 0 0.1 mil. So this one to begin with, this is titration one. The initial volume here looks to me, well, this is zero point, that's, what, that's zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and then this here is 0 0.3. And we're seeing that the bottom of the meniscus here is sitting in the middle between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. So I would call that 0 0.25. And then the final reading here, um, if you look um, carefully, this is um, 25. 25 is here, so we're going down by 0 0.1. So this would be 25.5, 25.5. 25.6, 25 25.7. This is sitting, the bottom of the meniscus here is sitting in line with 25.7. All right, so 25.70, we're good to, the, good to go we're using two decimal places. So we have that. So we're just going to write them there and then later we fill out our tables, right? Then we have over this side, that looks like 13. Let me see, the initial here is 13. What's that? We're looking at the bottom of the meniscus. 13.3, but we say we're doing it to um, two decimal places, so it's 13.30. A final reading in titration two, that is, what's that now? So that's 38.30, good. 
continue all the way to titration um titration three that one is sitting exactly on the bottom of the meniscus is there is sitting exactly on that's 15.50 all right 15.50 so we're going to fill out our table it's good if you're writing this down easy to follow so we're just going to be filling out um shortly so we have to complete our table all right so from one just now we're going to fill out and you need these values to work with so i'm going to ask you to take them down so that's 25.70 0 0.25 and then of course the volume used would say 25.7 minus 0.25 which would give us 25.45 we do the same thing initial reading here is 13.30 um final volume is 38.5 sorry 38.30 uh, let's take that again. Thirty-eight point three zero, and then you subtract twenty-five point zero zero over here. What does this work? No, the initial. What was the initial for this? Fifteen point five. Final was forty point five. And then we subtract, we get 25.00. And the idea is to get values that don't differ by more than point, point 0.1. So if we, get, if we get two values that are the same, then all the better. Awesome. So we would use these two for our calculations later on. So take those down. Those are the volume of um, M. They said that they're titrating solution. M again, solution solution um, n so this is volume of m used and we know that m is the acid is the hcl so this is the volume of hcl that is used so we're going to take these two values in a little in a little while we're going to take these two values of course average them 25 plus 25 50 divided by 2 we'll get 25 so we're going to um, move on to the next um next um question so we'd have got nine marks for doing all of that just now Calculate the average volume of solution M to be used. Show your work in 25.00 plus 25.00, please. Put that in bracket. Then you're going to divide by 2, which will give us 25.00. All right. And of course, you know, we're working with centimeters cubed. All right. Then um, they said calculate the concentration of hydrochloric acid in uh, solution M in moles per dm cube all right so they gave us the mass concentration if you remember they said the mass concentration for m which is hcl the mass concentration was three point let's just look back three point uh six three point six grams per dm cube and now they want us to calculate the molar concentration here so molar concentration we'll start off by saying Molar concentration is equal to mass concentration, right, divided by molar mass, all right? So we have, um, they give the RAM for hydro, hydrogen, the RAM for chlorine. So, of course, we can take that and find the molar mass. Um, HCl, that would be, um, oops, that would be, that would be, so that would be one hydrogen. So that's one times one equal one. Chlorine, 35.5 times one equal 35.5. Add them together, we get 36.5. So the mole, so that's the RMM, but we need the molar. We have to take, if we take the RMM and express it in terms of grams per mole, then that's the molar mass. So we'll take our mass concentration, which we have. We got it already. It was 3.6 grams per dm cube and we're going to divide that by the molar mass of hydrochloric acid or hcl in this case which is 36.5 grams per mole and when we do that we will get naturally 0 0.1 if you look at it that's like saying that's like saying 110 that's 0 0.1 and we'd be left with moles 
per diem cube. All right, so the grams would cancel out um, the grams and would be left with moles per dm cube. All right? If you ignore the dm cube, if you ignore the part about dm cube, because dm cube is just saying whatever is in a certain volume. If you ignore the dm cube, then it, it becomes um, a case where you're converting 3.6 grams to, to moles. And then all of that is in a certain volume. All right, that's, that's how the um, concentration comes in. You're talking about a certain number of moles or a certain, um, you know, number of grams within a certain volume. So if you ignore the DM cube for now, you find that all you're doing just now is converting from mass to moles by dividing by the molar mass. So if it were the other way around, now you'd be converting from, from moles to mass. And of course, you, you, you would multiply by the, by the molar mass. So... Very good, very good question. Yes, if it were the other way around, you would actually, um, yes, multiply by the molar mass. All right, so let's move on. So we have the answer for that one. We're going to move on to part four. Calculate the number of moles of hydrochloric acid used in the titration. So earlier on, we said the volume of the HCl that we used was 25. And we know the molar concentration already. So you know, I'm not even going to use any formula. Well, I guess we can touch on the formula later on. We know the concentration just now was zero point. The concentration of um, the HCl just now, we found it to be um, 0 0.1 moles per dm cube. So this is saying that 1,000 cm cube of HCl actually contains 0 0.1 moles. So in the titration, we had used 25 cm cube. That was our average volume. So we're saying how many moles would be present in that. So we just cross multiplying to get X. And uh, somebody punch out a calculator. What would we get for that? That would be 20.1 divided by. All right, cool. So of course, X would be equal to, let's see, that's 25 cm cube times 0 0.1 mole. All of that over 1,000 cm cube which would give us that's 2.5 times 10 to the minus three or 0 0.0025 moles. All right, for those who are inclined to using formulae, I'm not really a formula person because under pressure formula, we tend to forget the formulae. But anyway, um, let's see what this would look like. It's the same thing like we have here. We could say we know that um, concentration is equal to moles over volume. But volume has to be in dm cube. Volume must be in dm cube. So it follows that moles is equal to concentration times volume. But volume has to be in dm cube. So that's what we would have done here. We would have taken the concentration, which is 0 0.1 moles per dm cube. And we would um, now multiply it by the volume. But the volume has to be in dm cube. So we'd have to take this 25 cm cube and divide it by 1,000, which is what we're doing right here. And then when you do that, you realize that, hey, you end up with the same, you end up with the same thing. So formula is still showing you that, hey, it's the same working out. Write a balance equation for the reaction between. Okay, and when you say they give you this, don't feel insulted. HCl plus sodium hydroxide. Of course, we know we'll get salt sodium chloride really, and water. One to one mole ratio, I believe we're going to use that in short order. The determining number of moles of sodium hydroxide in a 25 cm cube of solution used. Now, if you remember from um, the, in the introduction, the, the volume of sodium, the volume of solution N that was used was 25. So it just happened that in both cases, the volume of the acid and the volume of the base the sodium hydroxide solution M for the acid and solution N for the sodium hydroxide, they are 25. So we just found out that the number of moles of the, the HCl that was used was 0 0.0025 moles. And we saw in the equation that we just um, wrote, the balanced equation, which I'm writing here again, we saw where the HCl and the NaOH react in a one to one mole ratio. So since they react in a one-to-one -one mole ratio, it follows that if one mole of 
eight cell is um, reacted, then it reacts with one mole of NaO8. So a while ago, we know that 0 0.0025 moles of eight cell reacted. So we know that that's a fact. So, so that's a fact. So we start out with that, that's a fact, right? HCl and NaOH react in a one-to-one -one mole ratio. So if 0 0.0025 moles of HCl was used, it reacted with that same number of moles, 0 0.0025 moles of NaOH in the 25 cm cube of solution N. All right, so it's the same number of moles present. It's a one-to-one -one mole ratio, so um, if, 0 0.0025 moles of the acid were used, then it means that that same number of moles of the base would have been present. And they want us to calculate now the, they want us to calculate now the concentration of sodium hydroxide, but they want it in grams per dm cube. So what we could do, we're going to cut, we're going to do it to um, calculate the molar concentration first, and then we convert that to mass concentration. All right, so we know that we know the number of moles um, that's present, the number of moles of sodium hydroxide that's present in the 25 cm cube. So we can just write our statement, 25 cm cube of NaOH contains 0 0.0025 moles. So we really want to know, we're interested in how many moles we have present in 1000 cm cube because that's when we know the concentration. All right, that contains X, of course. When we um, work that out, that's going to be um, 0 0.0025, um, 0 0.0025 times 40, and that will give us back 0 0.1. So X would be equal to 0 0.1 moles per dm cube. And over, over time, you figure out that 25 goes into 1,040 times. So if 25 contains a certain number, 1,000 will contain 40 times that number. So this is the molar concentration. We want mass concentration. We're now going to take this molar concentration that we have and multiply it by the molar mass and the, of sodium hydroxide. And they, they give us the molar mass so we don't have to do any work, you know. So we'll just take this, um, we'll just convert the mass concentration by taking 0 0.1 moles per dm cube times 40 grams per mole. And of course, you're seeing where the per mole can slow the, can slow the mole, and that should give us, that should give us 4.0 grams per dm cube. So that is what happens in a, in a titration. We normally have a solution whose concentration is known. So in this case, our HCl was our standard solution. We know its concentration. The concentration was given 3.6 grams per dm cube or 0 0.1 moles per dm cube. We titrated this against a solution whose concentration we don't know, right? So this is our standard solution here. Standard solution. Our sodium hydroxide, we didn't know its concentration. And based on the volume of each of them that was used and the, the balanced equation, showing how they react, we were able to determine that, hey, um, or better yet, so we would have used 25 cm cube of our eight cell. And the number of moles of that's that, pre that number of moles that's present there. All right, let me just take my time. All right, so normally do a table, didn't do the table route. So just to summarize what we would have just done. 
So we know this is HCl. Give us, give ourselves some space. So we have concentration, molar concentration. volume moles and then there's one more thing mole ratio so just looking at what we we had the molar concentration for the HCl we said was 0 0.1 moles per dm cube 0 0.1 and um, the molar concentration of the sodium hydroxide, we didn't know at the beginning. We used, so we're going to put the volume in dm cube. We used 25 cm cube of our, our acid. We can convert that to dm cube by dividing by 1,000. 25 divided by 1,000 will give us 0 0.0. So this is 0 0.025 dm cube we're working with. Let me just put it there for emphasis. And the number of moles that's present there would be, or we found it to be 0 0.0025. And then the mole ratio, or better yet, we have some other things that we, we had. For the, the base, the same volume was used. I just put it in DM cube, all right? And then uh, the, 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 the mole ratio, we know the mole ratio from the balanced equation. 1 to 1. So the mole ratio is 1 to 1. So because it's 1 to 1, the same number of moles that we have right here for the acid, right? So when we use 25 cm cube of this, this 25 cm cube contains this number of moles here. And then the 25 cm cube of the base that we started out with, it contains the same number of moles because it's a 1 to 1 mole ratio. Right, so we would get 0 0.0025 moles here. That 0 0.0025 moles is present in this volume that is there. And if we know moles and we know volume, then we can now find the concentration. So of course, if we're going back to the formula, it is the same thing. 0 0.0025 divided by 0 0.025, then that would give us 0 0.1. 0 0.1 moles per dm cube and they wanted to give they wanted us to give it in terms of mass concentration so we took this molar concentration and we multiplied by the molar mass and that's how we got 4.0 grams per dm cube so that's what we did we use a solution whose concentration we know to find out the concentration of another solution that we did not know based on um the fact that you know there's a Balance equation telling us the number of moles of each or how the substances um, combine. We had the volume, so we just worked. All right, so that's that. This will be on record so persons can, you know, go back over it. Um, question one is normally a lab question, a data analysis question. So don't just see the labs as something that you just get out, out of the way. You have to um, bear them in mind, you know, because the labs, um, they actually concretize the theory. Identify the forces that exist in a molecular solid. Now, if we're talking about a molecular solid, what kind of forces are we talking about? We could say um, intermolecular forces of attraction, Van der Waals forces, all right, for the one mark. So that would be intermolecular forces of attraction, Van der Waals, or Van der Waals um, forces of attraction. All right, so here, um, let's go back to where we can, we can write. So we'd say inter, where are we? Inter. Intermolecular forces or van der Waals, van der Waals forces. All right, molecular. Once you hear molecular solid, we're talking about what actually holds the different particles to, um, together. Like if we're looking at iodine, what holds the iodine, one iodine molecule to another um, iodine molecule? Not what holds the individual um, atoms together. All right, so 
Moving on, this part, sodium chloride, another solid has a high melting and boiling point. So the point I was trying to make just now, for molecular solid, you're looking at what holds the different molecules together in the solid, and it would be intermolecular force of attraction. So let me give you an example. So let's say this is um, iodine, I2. We know that this iodine, this molecule, is held by a, together by a covalent bond. Electrons are being shared. But what they're talking about when they're talking about molecular solid, because I2 is a molecule, it's not considered a solid. Many molecules would, have, would join together now to give you the iodine, um, the solid overall. So this is a molecule, but you have many of this molecule, these molecules join together. So what you'd actually have joining this molecule to another uh, molecule is what we call the intermolecular forces, or more specifically, Van der Waals forces. Because you know that electrons are always moving yeah, even though this is, this is a non-polar compound, ele electrons are always moving. If the electron shifts to one side, that side will be slightly negative. If that molecule goes near another molecule, it can induce in it a temporary dipole, causing this part of the molecule to be slightly positive. And so there will be an attraction. So this part would be slightly positive, and if it goes on, it's attracted to, if it goes in contact with another molecule, then the same thing happens. It induces a temporary dipole and it, you get this extensive, you know, force of attraction or, you know, this extensive, yeah, force of attraction holding um, one molecule to another, to another, to another, and so on. So the solid, what you have overall is just this bunch of Van der Waals forces or these weak forces of attraction holding the particles together in the solid, not what is holding the individual atoms in the molecule together but the whole solid overall all right so that's that wanted to clarify that so this is sodium chloride another solid has a high, higher melting point melting and boiling point than stearic acid explain why this is so so here we go this is another solid keyword right here another solid it has a higher melting and boiling point and by the way it's another solid so this solid of course is an ionic solid so we should be thinking along that line. So how are we going to approach this? Why is it that sodium would have high, sodium chloride would have higher melting and boiling point? Sodium chloride is an ionic compound. Yes, that's what you want to say there. So it would have, the force of attraction present would be stronger than those in steric acid. And then to top it off, you would say, if they are stronger force of attraction in the NaCl, then it would require more energy to break. So well done, that is that is that. Anytime you hear, anytime you see any comparison of boiling point, melting point, it goes back to the force of attraction. So we'd say that NaCl, NaCl is, is an, is an ionic compound with, let's emphasize it, strong, electrostatic forces of attraction, electro, S-T-A-T-I-C, electrostatic forces of attraction between the ions So it's an ionic compound, it's strong electrostatic forces of attraction which are harder to break or you could say which require more energy to break than forces of attraction in in steric acid you could you could say it in less words but you want to link you want to link um the the fact that the the melting and boiling point is higher you want to link that to it requiring more energy, all right? All righty, and then we get something to, to plot now for the rest of the four marks. So we're going to use the axes that are provided, and we're going to, so all right. So I have the values, I have the actual physical um, copy with me, so I'm just looking at it, zero. So we're plotting, let's see, time, time is on the, everything is done up for us. Time is on the x-axis, being the independent variable and at different time, 
we'll get different temperature readings, which the temperature readings here would be our responding or our dependent variable. So at zero, at zero, we're going to look for 19. Um, I hope you're seeing clearly. So before I plot, I look to see what each of those little strokes represents. And it seems like they represent one degree Celsius on the y-axis. So we're seeing that every little tiny little box we have right there represents one um, degree Celsius. And on the, on the x-axis, we're seeing that each of the little, the very little ones, they represent 0 0.1 um, minute. All right, one point. Is that, is that so? Yeah, one, yeah, that is it. All right, so zero, we're looking for 19. So I just need to find 20 and the one before 20. And remember, whenever you're plotting, you're using X's or certain um, dots that are circled. So I don't like X's. So I'll just go, I'll just go into the, the encircled dots. So that's my 19. And then 1.5, I'm looking for 40. Where is 1.5? I'm not really seeing this. Okay, 1.5 is okay. It's a little bit closer to over this side. Did I get it? All right. No, I didn't. All right. So I know you're seeing it clearly. I'm not seeing it clearly. So I'm just kind of doing a little guesstimate in a sense. So 1.5 ish. Let's see. Uh, got it. So that's 1.5, and we're going to go for 40 here. Can I follow this line and go up? 40, where is 40? 40 is just, okay, just about here. So I'm kind of doing a little blind, blind chemistry right about now. No, and that's not where 40 is. Not seeing it on my, oh, I think I know what I'll do. I have an idea. I think I can annotate over this side. Annotate, let's give it some time. All right, draw. The only thing though, I think I'll end up using the X's. I think that, I think I'll end up using the X's. Carry this up top. This is now in my way. All right. Annotate, all right, let's try this. All right, so we're looking at 1.5, 40, 40, 1.5. So it's going to be, all right, don't mind the mess. So I'm, I'm going to resort to, okay, so that's my dot. I just need to circle this now. Don't judge me. Okay, and it didn't come out. It looks like a blob on the paper, but it's a circle. I just changed what I'm using. All right, then 2.0 is 48. So at two minutes. 48 so this is 50 so i just need to come down two and then 48 would be here all right so that's my dot and i'm gonna circle it it doesn't look like a circle on on your display but it's based on what what i'm using to annotate 2.5 is 53 2.5 53 50 1 2 3 so I do my dot again and I'm going to circle it. Don't judge it. All right. And then uh, three is, is 55, 355. So three on the X, 55 out of hand eye coordination here. That's my dot. Circling my dot now. And then um, let's see, five is 55. Look at that. Five is 55, was that 53? I don't think I got 53 just now, you know. That should have been 53 a while ago. It doesn't look so righteous. So we're going to take back that one. All right, so take back that one. 53, oh, that was 55. I shouldn't have troubled that, that was 55. Okay, just to be on the safe side. So we have three, do we have three? Three is 55, let's ensure that we have. So this is the line I'm running with. Three and I'm looking for 55. Oh Lord, I need glasses. Or well, I have glasses, which I don't wear. Okay. All right, so that's that. Then we go over to five is also 55. Five, not moving the screen. Five is 55. So here we are. Five. 
All right, good. And then seven is 55 as well. Seven, oh, which they did for us, which they did for us. So they're saying, so we've done that. Draw the best fit curve through your points. Do not use a ruler for this one. This one should be done free-handedly. All right, um, it's going to be, well, let me not say it's going to be a challenge. Um, let me now go over to the other arm. So I'm gonna go best fit. That's it, in one go, you want it to be smooth. All right, I'm not going to move this. Let's see, are they asking us anything after that? So we've plotted, that's the end of it. So best fit, no ruler, you just do it free-handedly. Kind of rough it, kind of um, estimate it. Do it roughly like what you see the guys doing in golf before they do the shot, they practice it. All right, here does one smooth continuous line. So we now move on to number two. And I mean, in real time, we'd have spent more than, based on the nature of the class, we spent more than 30 minutes on the question. But you know, um, yeah, we just want to ensure that we get the concept right. So we're going to go a little faster. Now we're going to add a catalyst to all of this, or good old acid bases and salts. Phosphoric acid is a common additive in most soft drinks, right? It can react with sodium hydroxide and alkali to form both normal and acid salts. All right, I think we would have done this already. I think quite a few of us. Um, define the term acid and alkali. So an acid, all uh, right. Somebody give us that one. We won't even have to write it. We'll just move right. We'll just move right along. What's an acid? Oh, I like that word. A substance that yields H plus ions in aqueous medium, good. Or you could say, uh, substance that dissociates dissociates in aqueous a q u e o u s in aqueous medium to i'm going to use your word to yield h plus ions i like it to yield h plus ions and then or alkali what would be our alkali now? Our alkali. So the alkali now would be a you could well would be a substance that dissociates in aqueous medium, A Q U E O U S. Don't judge my handwriting, I'm not writing on paper to produce. Oh, I should have said yield. Same thing to produce OH minus ions. All right. And then we have acid salt versus normal salts. Acid salts, what are we talking about? It's formed, so we'll start. A substance formed when, when some, so the keyword here is some of the H plus ions in the acid are replaced by the metal metal ion or metal ion or the NH4 plus ion. So you'll get a salt when all of the H plus ions are replaced, but you get an acid salt when only some of the H plus ions are replaced. And not just a salt when all of them are replaced, we get a normal salt. All right, so for the normal salt, now this would be the, the substance or the compound form, substance or compound formed. When keyword all the H plus ions in an acid are replaced by the metal ion, by the metal or the NH4 plus ion. So that's a normal salt. Not that the other one is abnormal, but because you have some of the H plus remaining, you call it an acid salt. State the molecular formula for the normal salt formed from the reaction between phosphoric acid and sodium hydroxide. To know the um, acid is to know the salt. So phosphoric acid is H3PO4. If we're going to replace all of the H+, plus, we'll just take Na and put it wherever we see H. H. So it would be Na3PO4, sodium phosphate. No, but that's not where, that's not what they ask us for. They ask us, to, I'm putting that the wrong place. So let's go again. So it should be here, H3PO4. 
to know the acid is to know the salt. So if we replace all of the um the H plus, it would be N A three because sodium is in group one, and that would be Na three PO four. They want a balance equation to so show the formation of the normal salt stated in A3 above. So this is going to be our product. So we're starting with our acid H3PO4. And we're going with NaOH. And we know we're going to get Na3PO4. Na, that's 1 plus PO4. That's 3 minus LCM of 1 and 3. 3, 1 into 3, 3, 3 into 3, 1. So we're going to end up with, that's how we end up with Na3PO4. All right? So that's Na3PO4. It's a sol, it's um, acid and base equals, all sodium salts are soluble. So it's an acid and a base, so we'll get salt and water. Balance, we have, um, how does this work? Take off that so we can get some space. We have, um, what's that? This is A plus. Three sodium over the right hand side. So we'll put that three right there. And when we do that, let's see how it changes things. How does that change things? We'll need um, three water, three, two, six. So we have three hydrogen here. We have three right here, three, two, six. That settles it. So that's our balance equation there. And then let's see what else they're asking us about. State the molecular formula of an acid salt formed from the reaction between phosphoric acid and sodium hydroxide. We have options here, all right? We can look at when only, only uh, we can look at um, when only one of the hydrogen is replaced. So in this case, we can look at NaH2PO4, that's one of them, or we can replace two Na2HPO4. Then they want us to write a balance equation to show the formation of the, so let's call this one, let's call this two. So if we're working with the first one where we form NaH2, then let's go. We'll have, so if we're working with one, we can have H3PO4 plus NaOH, of course that's aqueous, it's an alkali soluble base, that would give us NaH2, PO4, A plus, plus water. Let's check to see if that is balanced, that looks balanced, or if we're working with the other one, so there are two options we have, or if we're working with the second one, we know that that would be H3, PO4 again and NaOH and of course we're going to have to balance it. That would give us Na2H PO4 A plus plus H2O liquid and we have to now balance. So we have two sodium on the right so we'd have to put two in front of the sodium hydroxide here for that to make sense. When we do that we realize we would have um, three hydrogen here Two hydrogen here, that's all of what? Um, that's what? Five. So if we put a two here in front of the water, that will make the hydrogen four, two, two, four, plus one in the um, the salt, the acid salt, five. So that would be it. All right, a solution of 0 0.05 molar phosphoric acid has a pH of four, and a solution of 0 0.05 molar sulfuric acid has a pH of one. Which of the two acids is stronger? Sulfuric acid. All right. Jeffrey complains of pains due to excess stomach acid after consuming too much orange juice. Really? Name two acids present in orange juice. And I know people are in between chemistry and bio. So this should be easy. So the acids present in orange juice will be, what are they? Ascorbic. Ascorbic acid. All right, good. And then now they're asking us to state the type of chemical reaction that takes place in the treatment of stomach acid. So you want to cancel out the acid, so you add something that's basic. What do you call that type of reaction? Neutralization. All right. 
Hence, name one substance that can be used to treat stomach acid. Be careful you don't give them a brand name. You want to give them the, the name of the, the compound, not the, um, the brand name. So you cannot give them Andrews. <laughs> you cannot give them um, Dica or, or um, Milk of Magnesia. You cannot give them Tums. You want to give them the substance that, that's present in it. So no brand name, no. Okay, you want to give them the active ingredient. So what are we working with? Magnesium hydroxide could work. Very good. Magnesium hydroxide. Let's make space for that. Magnesium hydroxide could work. We could also we could also use uh, magnesium carbonate. All right, I think that's the active ingredient in one of those um in one of those um in one of those substances they use or one of those brands they use to relieve stomach acid. All right, so magnesium hydroxide's formula is not MgCO three, so we could use magnesium hydroxide. Let me put or magnesium carbonate. Magnesium hydroxide is Mg bracket OH bracket two. All right, just setting that record straight though on persons watching this stuff later on to think that that's what circuit. All right, so ethene undergoes a halogenation reaction to form one to dichloroethene. Draw the fully displayed structure of ethene. Ethene is an alkene, so it must have the carbon carbon double bond. It's actually the first member of the alkene series. So this is what it would look like. Ensure that your carbons are always taking part in four bonds. So that's our ethene. Let's pause. When we um, add our halogen across the double bond, what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be breaking the bond right here. The carbon carbon double bond, we're going to be breaking that. So I normally draw a little um a pair of scissors. Okay, I haven't drawn it in a while. It tell us we're going to be cutting that bond. When we cut it, we're going to make space on the carbon now for for we're going to make space on the carbon for whatever we're adding. All right, so we're going to, we're just doing that to kind of set you up for the next um part they gave us in the introduction. Anyway, so the next thing that they're asking us to to draw is in part two, draw the fully displayed structure of the one, two dichloroethane. So we will go one, two dichloroethane. So it's like we're drawing ethane, but we're putting chlorine. You can put chlorine anywhere. You can put it here, here, or here. It doesn't matter. As long as chlorine is on one carbon, you have a chlorine on each of the carbons. So what we'll do, and for symmetry, I'll just put hydrogen here, hydrogen here, and um, and I'm going to break the symmetry. I'm going to put one chlorine right here and put one right here. Okay, so that's that. It doesn't matter. You could have drawn it like, you could have drawn it, you could have drawn it like this. As long as um, your chlorine is on each of your carbon, you're good to go. All right, same thing. Same thing, doesn't matter. All right, let's see what else they're asking. Is halogenation of eating an addition or substitution reaction? What do you think, guys? Addition, are you adding across the double bond or are you substituting? Are you taking off something addition. and putting on something else? Okay. Addition, alkenes undergo, well, in addition <laughs> to um, combustion, oh, I said additional, oops, addition. So in addition to combustion, they undergo a series of addition reactions. And the type of addition reaction depends on what you are adding. So if you're adding water, you call it hydration. If you're adding a halogen, you call it halogenation. If you're adding hydrogen, you call it hydrogenation. And I guess if you're adding, you know, depending on what you're adding, that's how you get the name. If you're adding wall food, you probably call it wall foundation or something of the sort. But yeah, not interested in that reaction. All right, moving right along. Dichloromethane can be obtained from methane. Dichloromethane. Di means two. Chlorine coming from chloro coming from chlorine, and then methane coming from the root. Methane, methane. 
this reaction takes place in two steps, dichloromethane. Of course, you'd have to add on the first chlorine and you'd have to put on the first chlorine or substitute a hydrogen for a chlorine. And then after you get a substituted product, you, you, you continue with that. So they want us, they said the reaction takes place in two steps. Yes, obviously. Um, and then they want us to write balanced chemical equation to show each step in the formation of dichloromethane. So it's, it's like you have a team. Let me see, football coming up next year, all right. You have a team, World Cup, 11 persons on the football team. You can show the start in 11, and you can show what happens after two substitutions. But you're not going to do the two subs at the same time. So Stephen John is not playing well, and we just, you know, tell ref that we're making a sub. We take off Stephen John, and we put on, we put on, let's see. So, so Stephen John is not playing well, so we take off Stephen John and we put on Leah K. Robertson. All right? And then, okay, we realize that somebody else on the team who started not playing well either. So Shari wasn't playing well, so we sub, we sub Shari and we put in Laurel e. Rattery. But they want us to show two steps. So we're going to show them methane. All right? That's from the alkane series. And um, that's the first one in the alkane series. And I normally say me. Me is not really um what you call it. It's not a direct object pronoun. But I mean me, when you think of me, you're thinking about singular. It's the first one. Anyway, don't need to over explain. CH4, it's a gas. And the conditions we need, we're going to need the chlorine, right? Cl2, right? Which is also a gas. All of this is occurring in the presence of U um UV light. So we can put UV right there. Cool. And then of course. We know what we're going to get from this. We're going to get CH3. We're taking off one of the hydrogen and we're, we're replacing it with a chlorine. Cool. And then this is also a gas. And then, of course, everything has to balance out. The hydrogen that um, came off hooked up with the other chlorine because it's really... Two chlorine right here, the Cl2 right here, Cl join with Cl. What really happens is that your HL UV light comes in and psh, splits this into two radicals. Don't worry about the mechanism, the mechanism is for K. These species are very reactive. We call them radicals, but the word I use for them, I said that them name hotted. You know, radicals, they're very reactive, so they are what go in now and kick off the hydrogen from the methane. And then, of course, um, one of them will have a place on the on where one of the hydrogen was, and the hydrogen that's kicked off goes with the other one. So this is step one. In the next step, you know what will happen. You will have to take your the product right here, the substituted product, the new team that has chlorine on it now instead of this. Oops, where's that? I hope I didn't erase that. Let's go again. Blue, pick blue. So that. Substituted product is going to be our starting material in step two. So in step two, we'll take our chloromethane, CH3, Cl, gas, and we're going to, in the presence of chlorine, we're going to subject it again to UV light, which is going to cause the same thing. Uh, we're going to have the chlorine splitting into two to give you two chlorine radicals. And again, we're going to get one of the chlorine radicals actually taking the place of one of the hydrogens. So instead of having three hydrogen this time, we're going to have two. And then we're going to have Cl2 right here. By this time, this thing is now a liquid, dichloromethane. And then we will have H. CL gas. So those are the those are the two steps. It's disubstituted, it is taking off one hydrogen each time and replacing it with chlorine. So the reaction earlier with uh chlorine being added to the ethane, ethene was an addition reaction, and this now is what we call a substitution reaction. And I believe that's what they're going to ask um, next, naturally. Is the halogenation of methane an addition or substitution reaction? So, of course, we know 
sub substitution our alkanes are not as reactive as our alkenes so our alkanes undergo two types of reactions combustion they burn just like our alkanes but they only undergo substitution unlike our alke alkenes which allow for several substances to be added across the double bond and depending on the name of the substance you get a particular name for that reaction hydration addition of water halogenation addition of halogen etc but for the um halo for the alkene you just have combustion combustion and substitution all right so that is that and this takes us to part c Ethene and propene are typical monomers which are used as starting materials for making polymers. In forming polymers, ethene and propene undergo addition polymerization. Define the term polymer. All right, the word poly means many, but let's just get to the point. Polymer is a substance formed from the combination of 50 or more monomer units. Do not just say many. They actually have a number for the many. All right? It's actually 50, 50 or more. All right. Define what is meant by addition polymerization. All right, and this one we're adding. So first, it's a type. So it's a type of polymerization where where identical monomer units are joined to form one compound or one long chain or you could say the joining of many monomer units to give you one long chain compound you put long chain in bracket not that you'd put it in bracket but you know you don't speak like me my idiot idiolect is you know unique to me or not really unique to me but it's not necessarily the same as yours all right, so you could say it's a joining of many monomer units to give one long chain compound, or you could put it like I've put it there. All right, remember we're not doing this to, to say, hey, I want this question to repeat. We're doing this to based on the, the specific objectives. So if you really can cover the um, specific objective, you should be fine. So if new questions come, it should not be an issue as long as you apply what you know to the new situation, you should be fine. So we're not doing this hoping to see this again, all right? So I hope I'm not bursting anybody's bubble. All right, so the next part, state one use of each of the following polymers. So they have PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and one of the, well, there are several, there's a one for each, we'll give them probably two. All right, so PVC, we use them to, to make pipes for electrical conduits. Electrical conduits. We also use them to make buckets, PVC. All right, the access for one, Teflon. Teflon. I think uh, one of Chronics is um, par is called Teflon. You know, and it's, it's a really cool name. I guess the, the name is really cool. It's it's meant to be something that's tough. It's a polymer. But I mean, Teflon is not that tough. Teflon is the thing you find in the line in your frying pans to make it non-stick. The, the material that they use to line the frying pan, the non-stick frying pan is actually Teflon. But Teflon is not really that hard. I mean, if you get steel wool or scotch bright, you can rub it off. But anyway, Teflon, we use it to coat. So it's used to coat frying pans. We could say as a non-stick agent. 
as a non-stick agent. And then we have poly and they put the bracket ethene polythene. And every Jamaican knows this using the manufacturing of of plastic bags. Even though we, are, we have a band, we still see plastic bags. Polythene, poly bags. All right, that's that. All right, so when a reaction is accompanied by energy change, by, well, by energy changes, it can be categorized as either endothermic or exothermic. Distinguish between the terms endothermic and exothermic. So endothermic is a change or a reaction characterized by, okay, so I'm going to just make the sentence short, just stick to the point. So a reaction characterized by energy being absorbed, endothermic, characterized by energy being absorbed, whereas exothermic, is a reaction characterized by, by energy. And the energy we're talking here, talking about here is heat energy, energy being released. All right, so endothermic will feel cold, exothermic will feel hot. Generally, when chemical reactions take place, existing bonds are broken and the bonds, new bonds are formed. Classify bond making and bond breaking as either endothermic or exothermic. So bond, bond making, the formation of new bonds re result, in energy being, result in energy being released. When new bonds are formed, that process is exothermic. When bonds are being broken, energy has to be pumped in to break those bonds. So we call that process endothermic. And so we're going quickly, so we'll just do that. In an experiment, when 12 grams of potassium nitrate, keyword right here, 12 grams of potassium nitrate, which we're not going to use right now, we're going to use it later on, is dissolving 100 cm cube of water, the temperature drops by 4.2 degrees Celsius. Calculate the number of moles of potassium nitrate, even though we're not going to use it right away. So moles is equal to mass over molar mass. So they gave us the RMM, so we're going to take that and just add grams per mole to it for the molar mass. So this is equal to 12 grams divided by 101 grams per mole. And when you do that, you should end up with 0 0.02 moles. We're not ready for that yet. Just hold on to that. Calculate the heat change from the reaction above. Heat changes, um, well, yeah, get the specific, you, you, they gave it a specific heat capacity of water, 4.2 joule per gram per degree Celsius. And they give us the formula for heat change, MC delta T. M that we're using here is the mass of water that you know work is going to be done on. So a certain amount of energy, specific heat capacity, tells us the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. That is what you're doing when you're cooking, except you're using a lot of water, especially when you're making soup. All right. So, um, so here we are. We have, we have. We have, um, so we're going to work. So it's a heat change, delta H. The mass that we're working with is 100 cm cube. And they're saying that we're going to use the density of water as one gram per cm cube. So it means that um, the 100 cm cube can be written as 100 grams. So we're going to see how much energy we need to actually raise um, the temperature. Or don't, don't have to get into that. So the mass that we're working on is 100 grams. We're going to raise that. or drop that depending on the case. Well, we saw that the temperature dropped by 4.2. So MC delta T, 100 grams is the mass. Let me just leave it there. The heat capacity is given as 4.2 joule per gram per degree Celsius. And the temperature dropped by 4.2. Just now, so we don't need to calculate any change. They already did it for us, 4.2 degrees Celsius. So we're just going to take that punch those in when we do that we're going to end up 17 1764 joules 
So that is the heat change. This is the heat change when, so this is the amount of energy released. Well, the temperature dropped. No, it's not um, released, it's absorbed. Temperature dropped, so it means that we're talking about a positive um, value here. So this amount of energy was absorbed when uh, 12 grams of KNO3 was dissolved in water. This 12 grams is the same as 0 0.02 moles. So that was the heat change when 0 0.02 moles um, were, um, of potassium nitrate were dissolved in 100 grams of water. They want us to calculate the heat change for one mole of potassium nitrate. So all we're going to say here, hey, we're going to say 1764 joules were um, produced when 0 0.02 moles of the potassium nitrate was dissolved. So we want to know the energy that we would actually get if we had used one mole. That's what we want to do. That's, all, that's what we want to do right there. So we could just say, okay, <clears throat> in essence, they're asking us for the enthalpy of solution, which is the energy change when one mole of a substance dissolves in water. So we're going to use the heat change that we get, that we got there, 1764 joules divided by 0 0.02 moles. And that would give us 88,000 200 joules per mole or we could just write this as 88.2 kilojoule per per mole so we said list two two pieces of apparatus necessary to conduct the experiment in a school lab state how um how each piece of apparatus is used. Now they say two piece necessary if it's an inner, if it's an energetics experiment. There is something that let's see what we'll need. We will need thermometer. Can't do, you can't measure heat change without a thermometer. And don't frown at it. It's still coming on paper one. So we need a thermometer, and this is used to determine, used to take, used to take temperature reading temperature readings before and after KNO3 is added to 100 grams of water so that's um one of the thing one of the up um, the one of the pieces of apparatus necessary and I believe another piece that's necessary is a styrofoam cup. Some of you will probably say be about the styrofoam cup is better. So this is going to be what do you use this to this is um this is going to how do you say contain the liquid keep the liquid hold the liquid this is the system this is what everything will happen in Min let's put it this way it minimizes minimizes um heat heat loss or gain heat loss or heat gain to or from surrounding all right so those are two things necessary all right we'll say we're moving fast especially since this is not in the 10. Draw a label that label energy profile diagram to represent the enthalpy change for the reaction. On your diagram, indicate the sign for delta H. So the temperature drop we said earlier. So if the temperature dropped, it means that energy would have been absorbed. Heat energy would have been absorbed. All right. So things would feel cold. So it means that our products are going to be at a higher energy level than our reactants. So energy is on the y-axis. And we have the reaction course or the progress of reaction on the x-axis. Progress of reaction on our x-axis. Energy is in on our y-axis. So here we have, and what I like to do, I like to write out the things that I'm using. So this is KNO3 solid plus H2O liquid. And um, energy has to be pumped in. Right, activation energy. 
And then here we go up top. We have our products at a higher energy level, KNO3, in the presence of water aqueous. Carry this over. These two right here. All right, delta H. This should be a double-headed arrow, but I can't fix that. So let's put that right here. So that's delta H. Okay, I don't have a, I can't draw a triangle. So I'll just put, I'll just call it delta H. And that is equal to positive. Delta H is positive. All right. All right, so the compound responsible for, this is organic, the compound responsible for the odors. I don't know why they say odor. They should say this, this the odor, odor, odor depicts um, something smelling bad. They should say fragrance. But anyway, um, so the compound re uh, responsible for the fragrance of apples is ethyl pentanoate, C4H9COO, C2H5. Acid part is at the front. I hope we're seeing that. The front right here, we have the acid portion here from the pen, pent and C. This part here is a part of the, is a part of the, is counted as a part of the chain. And then over here now, we have the alcohol part. So over here is the alcohol part, AL. That's the alcohol part, okay? That part is from the alcohol. And over here is from the, a from the acid. Okay, state the homologous series to which ethyl pentanoate belongs. Ethyl pentanoate, definitely an ester. All right, draw the fully displayed structure of ethyl pentanoate and circle the functional group. All right, every time I draw an ester, well, not every time, but I try each time I draw an ester to, to, all right, so this is better. I try each time I draw an ester to, to keep the functional group. So ethyl pentanoate and they want us to circle the functional group. So let's do this in black. All right, ethyl pentanoate. So we're going to draw the, we draw the acid part first, ethyl pentanoate. So we draw the pentanoate part first. So we draw the acid part first, draw the alcohol part last, but we name it the other way around. We name the alcohol part first and the acid part name is named last. Ethyl one, two, three, four, we need five. So the other C with the double bond O, this part, so C double bond, that's a double bond, okay? O. And so that's the acid portion, all of five carbons. Then this part now is coming from the alcohol. This would be O ethyl. So it's C2H5. Sorry, yeah, C2H5. But we're going to break it down because they said they want the fully displayed um, structure. So we have to ex expand it. So we're going to dress up now. And by dressing up, I mean putting on all the hydrogens on the carbons. Each carbon must be taking part in, in four bonds. So I think I have a, a little shortcut where I can do this since I'm, I've, I've had to resort to, you know, using what I'm using. So we're just going to ensure that we put on all our hydrogens. Each carbon must be taking part in four bonds. Carbon is tetravalent, as we know. All right, so let's see if we can make this fun or easy. I don't know if it will work. Let's see. All right, let's see if we can do. Okay, let's just go back to basics. All right, so I guess this will take a little while. So hydrogen is supposed to be here. I don't want to leave it. And persons think that it's fine to just leave it there without the hydrogens. You get the point. They give us a compound that has a lot of hydrogens, all right? So there's a few more to go. So fully displayed, so we have to draw them all out. Fully displayed, we're drawing them all out. All right? So we have about eight left. 
one, two, five, well, seven left, six left, those are hydrogens, don't judge them, they're hydrogens, all right, all right, just four more. That was hydrogen as well. And they want us to circle the functional group. So of course, we're going to circle the functional group. And we circle the functional group. And that is our ester linkage. That's our ester linkage. All right, and they want us to write the molecular formula for the alcohol and carboxylic acid that will react to give us um to give us ethyl pentanoate for the alcohol and carboxylic acid. So let's see. Oh, we know that when we remove the screen. So write the molecular formula for the alcohol and carboxylic acid. So they say ethyl pentanoate. So we're talking about pentanoic acid. Molecular formula. Molecular formula, okay, so we know how we'd write it, or it, um, I'm going to use um, text, but we know that we'll make these numbers subscript, all right? This is just um, based on the means that I have working with right now. So the ethanol, so the alcohol, so we'll work with the alcohol. So the alcohol, so the alcohol would be um, C2H5OH. And the carboxylic acid, that word, carboxylic, carboxylic, X, Y, L, I, C, the carboxylic acid, would be C4, H9, C, O, O, H, and those numbers are all subscripts, all right? Esther, okay, cool, all right. So on to the, name the catalyst involved in the reaction between alcohol and carboxylic acid stated in uh, C3. So for the formation of the ester, we know that um, it's esterification, we'll have heat and reflux, and the catalyst that we use in there would be sulfuric, sulfuric acid. That's our catalyst. Explain why an ester has low solubility in water, whereas a, whereas a simple alcohol is very soluble in water. All right, so if you look at the compound that we just drew, the alcohol is polar. There's a little part of the ester that has a little po polar and that is polar, but it's not as polar as our alcohol. So what you can do when you look, look at alcohols are polar, very good. When you look at molecules, you look at the amount of CH that is present. The amount of CH, the CH part of the molecule is non-polar. That part we normally say that it's oily, it's non-polar. And then parts that have like OH, you know, those parts are polar. So we could um, state that, let me just um, see if I can get it in as well. So let's go right here. So ester, oh Lord, ester, is, the ester is more, is more non-polar. Or we could say more non-polar. You call it now having okay let me get this going so it's more non-polar having more you call it ch2 groups present so there's a there's a small part so there's a small part in the middle that is slightly polar but it's not as polar as the ethanol that has the OH group, right? Which is polar. So the OH group is what interacts very well with, with, um, with water, which will make it very um, soluble in water. So the, the ester is more non-polar, having a lot of CH2 group, groups, while the 
Okay, we'll add the ester linkage, the ester bond or linkage, bond slash linkage has some degree of polarity or dipole, but it is not as polar as the O, the OH group in the alcohol. It's not as polar as the OH group in the alcohol, which interacts well or very well, interacts very well, very well with water, which is also polar. And as we all know, like, like molecules will dissolve like molecules. All right. That's that. Drop that in. We're good to go. And then no state the reaction conditions and reagents used for the alkaline hydrolysis of ethyl ethanoate. Hence, write a balanced chemical equation for this reaction. So the condition that we need, alkaline hydrolysis, it means we're going to have to use um, an, an alkali. We can use either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. So let's um, get this going. So we're going to use, of course, this is under, let's go, this is under reflux. Okay, text, text. This is under reflux. All right, color. All right, so this is on the reflux. Reflux. Good Lord. Reflux. So this is on the reflux. We're using NaOH or KOH. That's the condition. And in the balanced chemical equation, we're going to, we can work with any one of, of the, um, um, of the um, above. So this would be, um, Ethyl ethanoate, so it's um, CH3, except capital, CH3, COO, C2H5, and all of those should be um, subscript. And then this would be um, a liquid subscript as well. Let's work with NaOH, alkaline hydrolysis, the sodium hydroxide arrow. And this would give us, let's extend this. From this, we're going to get the salt. We're going to get the salt of the acid. So the acid would have been, of course, we'll have reflux and all of the conditions above. So the salt would be, um, so the acid here would be ethanoic acid. So we're going to get the salt from that. So it would be CH3COONA, common, common A. And that part would be aqueous. And then we would get the alcohol C2H5OH, which would be an aqueous medium as well. All right, so we get back. So this time, because the base is there, the acid will be formed, but the base that is present would react with the acid to give us the salt. So we get sodium ethanoate from the ethanoic acid, because this thing is going to split right here. What's happening? Uh, we're splitting right where we join it. So right at the ester bond, we cut it in two. Right, and we put on back the we put on back the OH and the acid portion over here. But then the acid now would react with the, with, the, with the sodium hydroxide to give us back sodium ethanoate. And for the alcohol, we're piecing on back the the H on this. So we're putting on back the H on this, and that's how we end up back with the alcohol over here. All right. So let me. Make, See if we can make a connection. So we'd get back the alcohol over here. And then here we'd get back the acid by putting on back the OH. Because you, you're, you're cutting, it's a reverse of um, esterification. So you'd get water, split the water in two, put the OH back onto the um, acid portion. But then the acid reacts with the base to give us sodium ethanoate. All right, let's see what's happening here. What exactly does reflux mean? All right, so reflux is like what happens in your, in your stomach. Oh, darn, I don't have the thing to, to draw it back. Hold on. So reflux means that I'm going, to, I'm going to show you in a little bit. 
reflux means that the 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 whole mixture the the in this case the ester and the base is in one container which keeps boiling up okay i need a diagram i need a diagram to do this but think of think of your stomach when you have acid reflux it means that the acid that's produced by the stomach it um it it flows back up in your esophagus right and it gives you heartburns right so in reflux it's something similar to that so reflux for you to understand reflux you have to pull back on your knowledge of distillation Reflux. Okay. 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 So, so good question. All right. So you're you're familiar with with simple distillation or you should be familiar with simple distillation you would have your flask you would have heat thermometer is here it's your thermometer And that's your, I just call it a, or your line, let's call it a line. That's going to take your vapors, that's going to take your vapors, um, that's going to carry your vapor from one end, from the boiler over to, to where you collect the fractions. All right, so of course we know we're going to need a condenser here. So this is what happens in um, normal distillation. And we have something over here collecting our fractions. As the substance heats up and um, it starts to, what you call it, you know, evaporate or boil, um, vapor will come up and it will eventually travel across here. Now this is your condenser, so you know water travels in here, cool water, water enters from the cool end and this is water out. So water in, water out. So what water is in here, so it means that it will cool what the vapor that we have right here. The vapor will condense. The vapor will condense and will collect over here. That's what we, we know for normal, um, for distillation. Distillation, simple, simple distillation. No, so this is um, simple distillation and you get your different your different fractions all right now in reflux reflux is um similar but different we have our heat still but in reflux all right let's let's just for all right we can, we'll still put in our um thermometer or we can leave out the thermometer Let's um, see if we fix this. Let's try that again. Close this up. So in, in with reflux, this is what you have happening. So this is water in from that end, water out from the hot end. So H2O in, H2O out all right so this time around of course your substance is being heated and of course it will try the vapor will will travel up the line here but the water will come in and cool it and it will condense and what it will do it will fall back down and it will boil again and go up and will cool and fall back down so you just have boiling and cooling and boiling and cooling all over again so that's why we call it um reflux See, it's almost like the churning motion you get when the acid is coming back up from your stomach into your esophagus, kind of gross. But so what you have happening, 
this boiling and cooling causes the products that would be leaving to actually fall back down into the into the um the boiler. So at the end of the day, you'd have a mixture, you'd have a mixture of your reactants and products. And over time, you would not you would not have any products over time. Sorry, you would not have any reactants over time. So you would when you finish, you'd have to do um you'd have to use um the process of well this was this was not the formation of the ester. Um, so we're looking at, um, we're looking at from the question we would have had CH3COONA plus the alcohol, right? So anyway, the, to answer your question though, reflux just means that the, the mixture is boiling and when it cools, when the vapor collected or the vapor goes up in the tube, it cools and falls back down. So you just have, this is almost like a convectional thing going on. So yeah, you just have it boiling, cooling, condensing, falling back down, boiling, cooling, condensing, falling back down. So in essence, none of the none of the mixture, none of the substances will leave. All right. So it's so the, the condenser is directly above the heater or the boiler. So the subs the vapors boil the vapors cool and fall back down. Then the boil again, go up, cool, fall back down. All right, so that's pretty much that for reflux. They're now asking, they're saying commercial soaps are usually manufactured using, using natural esters. Name the process used to make the soap. All right, it's not um, an insult. Process used to make the soap is called saponification, saponification. And they want us to tell the source of these natural esters. The source. They're really from fats and or oils. So, you know, depending on how the world is turning or the economy or, you know, you can decide to go in a soap making business. You can use cooking oil, different, different oils, pork fat, beef fat, and base, and you can make your soap, but you need to add fragrance. So, you know, it can smell nice and all of that simple process. Part A of number six, list four unique properties of water as it relates to the human body. We have to relate, we have to relate them to the human body. So we're not just listing four unique properties of water. Yes, water is unique, water is great, but we have to relate them to the human body. So the first one that we're going to um, give is the fact that it has a really, it has relatively high melting and boiling point, and we'll see how that relates to the human body. Melting point is zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. So at between zero, between zero and 100 degrees Celsius, water then would exist as a, as a liquid. So at the optimum body temperature, water is a liquid, making it very useful for all the other functions that it carries out in the body or that it facilitates in the body. So it is a liquid at the body's optimum temperature. Making it most useful. All right, and if you're able to put this in less, in fewer words, all the better. So we're going to um, fit the other three in the space that we have left. So another um, property of water that may, um, and another unique property of water and how it relates to the human body. Um, the first one that we've listed is related to all the others in a sense. So the, the, second, the second one that we will um, look at is the fact that it's a universal solvent. So it dissolves ionic and covalent substances. It dissolves minerals and food. So it allows for it allows for substances to be dissolved. So chemical reactions can take place within the cells. So food can be transported. So the body can rid itself of waste. So all of those things.
Three, the third um, unique property, it has high specific heat capacity. It has high specific heat capacity. So this makes it hard for the, the, the temperature of the body to, so it can absorb a lot of heat without the temperature changing. So in a sense, we don't overheat. So it absorbs a lot of heat without changing temperature. So the body is kept, body temp is kept constant. And four, and as I said, if you can summarize, then all the better. I've been working on summarizing from high school. And the last one, it has a, does a high heat of vaporization. And this is good because it helps to, it helps the body to cool down. There's heat exchange taking place from evaporative cooling. So the body can cool down through sweating. And that would give us um, four marks. Water exists in liquid, solid, and gaseous state. Describe a laboratory test for water vapor. Okay, so we use cobalt two chloride vapor. The presence of water vapor changes it from blue to pink. We could also use anhydrous copper, sul copper two sulfate, which is white, and the presence of moisture, the presence of water, causes it to change from white to blue. That would give you your marks. Part C. In some Caribbean islands, calcium hydrogen carbonate, in some Caribbean islands, calcium hydrogen carbonate causes temporary hardness in water. Definitely here. This can be treated by the use of washing soda, sodium carbonate. Write a balanced chemical equation, including state symbols to show the removal of temporary hardness from water using this treatment. So we're going to just write the balanced equation straight up. And this is a good equation for you to practice. Um, to write your ionic equations from, but we're just going to get to the point and just um, do what is um, required of us. So calcium hydrogen carbonate is aqueous, it's soluble. So it's CA bracket HCO3 bracket two aqueous plus washing soda, Na2CO3, Equals and this will give us this is a double decomposition reaction. Um, this will give us well, it could be called a precipitation reaction as well. It is both. Um, it will give us calcium carbonate, and that is what will pretty much arrest the calcium ions. Because if we're removing the, the ions that cause the uh, hardness, if we remove the ions that cause the hardness, then it means that we're pretty much softening the, the water. So this will pretty much arrest the calcium ions because they're pretty much being removed. That's what's happening in the background. But we're not going to be breaking it down to look at the ionic equations. You can do that for practice. So, and then this will also give us sodium hydrogen carbonate. But yes, it's aqueous and would, we would need two because we have two, we have two sodium in the Na, two CO3 sodium carbonate. So this would be two right there and that will do it. We are balanced, that is it, three marks. So in, when this happens, this is how the calcium ions are, are arrested or they are removed. And this is, the, this is the last question, question D for six marks. Be not dismayed, it looks big. The first one was all of four, this six. It's fine, let's just break it down, literally. Pure water does not conduct electricity, but can be acidified using dilute sulfuric acid for this to occur. Predict the ions that will migrate to the anode and cathode during the electrolysis of dilute sulfuric acid, aka acidified water. 
write a balanced chemical equation, including state symbols for the electrolysis of dilute sulfuric acid, acidified water. All right, so before we look at the ions that will migrate to the anode or the cathode, let us look at the ions that are present. So we would have H plus, well, from the water that would have been acidified and from the sulfuric acid itself, SO2, or minus, we would also have OH, OH minus, that's the hydroxide ions from the water. And yes, we have H plus again from the water. H plus, H plus, they're still identical, still H plus at the end of the day. So we have the cation we have here would be H plus. And the anions we have are sulfate ions and the hydroxide ions. So just a reminder, I normally put a sign beside the electrode so we don't put like charges together. So anode is positive. So the ions that would migrate to the anode would be the sulfate ion, the so for two minus ions and the hydroxide ions, OH minus ions. And these are aqueous, they're in the presence of water, aqueous coming from aqua. Now the ions that would migrate to the cathode, we only have one type of cation, one type of positive ion. So we have H plus going there. Now the balanced equation for what is happening, all right, I'm going to put the balanced equation at the end. But to get the balanced equation, we're going to be looking at what is happening at each electrode. But we're just going to put the final thing at the end. Now I've always been, I've always advocated for us to use the correct convention when we're doing, when we're writing oxidation. Some books will show minus, you know, whatever the species is minus, whatever the species is minus electrons, but that convention is incorrect. And this is a question that shows us why we're, we use the convention that we use or why this convention, convention is, is to be used or is correct. So, all right, so let us look at what happens let us look at what happens at the, at the anode and at the cathode. So I'm going to use blue so we can be guided. We know that we're just showing you the half equations and then we're going to put the half equations together to give you the final balanced equation. So um, of course, a little background at the anode. Well, a lot of answering is required in the background here because we have to decide which ions, which of the the negative ions, which of these anions will be liberated, liberated or will be given the nod. So we'll have the electrochemical series for anions. We have carbonate, sulfate, nitrate, chloride, bromide, iodide, OH. So OH is lower in the, in the reactivity series, which tells us that it requires less energy to be liberated. So the ease of ionic, the ease of liberation or the ease of, of an ion becoming discharged increases down the, 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 the series here. So OH requires less energy for OH to be liberated than our sulfate. So OH will be given the nod. When this happens, and it's very few things that I ask persons to commit to memory. This is, this is one of them. We will have, this is, the ionic, this is the ionic half equation for when OH minus ions are liberated. For OH minus ions, aqueous to give. So we need the arrow here. And this will give us two water which is a liquid plus oxygen, that's O2 gas, plus four electrons. These four electrons that are liberated, or the, these four electrons are made available at the anode. They're pulled up at the anode, sucked in at the positive terminal of the power supply or the battery, pushed out at the cathode and the, at the, the negative terminal, and then they travel down to the wire. If there's a bulb, the bulb lights up, it goes, it makes itself, they make themselves available at the, the cathode. They are pushed out at the cathode now. These same electrons, 
that are give, given up or made available at the, um, at the anode, these are the same electrons that are going to now be received at the cathode. So at the cathode, our hydrogen or H plus ions are waiting. So we would have four H plus, or we could just have H plus, but because we know it's four electrons, the same electrons that are lost are the same electrons that are gained. It's a transfer of electron process. So we'd have our H plus ions waiting and they will accept those four electrons and they will form hydrogen gas. Two moles of hydrogen gas. So bubbling will be taking place at the cathode. Bubbling will be taking place at the anode as well. And we'd expect twice the amount of bubbling to be taking place at the cathode for I won't say obvious reasons. But we have two moles of gas at the cathode, one mole of gas at the anode. Okay, so what we're going to do now to get the balanced equation, we will now combine these two half equations that are in blue. Again, our final answer is in red. So when we combine our half equations, this is what we're going to get. We're going to put all that is on the left-hand side together and everything on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side together. So on the left-hand side, we'll have 4OH minus A plus plus 4H plus A plus plus four electrons to give, let's look at what's on the right, starting with the top equation, the top half equation. Two water liquid plus O2 gas plus four electrons plus H2 gas. And just so things don't look too crowded, let's just clear the sidebar or the side part of the board for our people. So there we go. So what we'll do now, when we have this, we now cancel out based on electrons. So four electrons are on the left. We... Oh, let's get that back, not there. Right, so we're going to now cross out our electrons. We have four electrons on the left, four electrons on the right. So we eliminate them and whatever we're left with is our balanced equation. So the transfer of electrons, four electrons on the left, four electrons on the right, is just showing you what is happening overall with the, the whole process. It's a transfer of electron process. When we take out those electrons, now we, we just show you the net overall balanced equation, if that's even a word. So the final thing now is what we would give as our answer. So, and we're working with what's in red. So this would be 4OH minus equals plus 4H plus equals to give 2H2O liquid plus O2 gas plus H2 gas. This is what is happening. This is what is happening overall. So this is what our answer would be. And we had what's in red for the earlier part. So that would give us full marks. So that's it. Electrolysis is a, redox is a transfer of electron process. And electrolysis is pretty much redox applied. So here we go, six marks and a total of 50 marks. And just like that, we have come to the end of another full work through. Be sure to check out the other materials on the channel and let's interact. Leave a comment. See you in next video. Couple later.